during the presentation. Um, I think we're waiting for the video to be played. So give it a minute or two and we'll get started. analysis in the OVS OVN based deployments using AI and machine learning. I'm going to take a typical OpenStack deployment as an example for this discussion. Okay. Okay, we're going to restart it once we have the video up. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gurpreet Singh. I'm in the product management team at Red Hat, uh, focusing on networking and NFV. And today I'm going to talk about automating root cause analysis in the OVS OVN based deployments using AI and machine learning. I'm going to take a typical OpenStack deployment as an example for this discussion. Uh, just to appreciate the complexity and the scale of the problem, right? Uh, we have the OpenStack control plane, and there are various components involved there. So, so if a customer or let's say a service provider or network operator is experiencing uh, service degradation or uh, uh, service unavailability, uh, it could be on the control plane side. Right. So there are various metrics which we want to collect, which we want to look at uh, to detect those kind of problems. And similarly, on the data plane side, um, when we are talking about, you know, uh, data path type, uh, it could be a kernel data path. Uh, we could have fast data path, uh, such as SRIV or DPDK. From the forwarding side, the forwarding or the data, uh, traffic could be going from the compute nodes uh, to the centralized gateway, such as the network nodes, right? Or you could have the traffic going from uh, compute nodes to the top of the rack switches, right? Uh, using TVR and to the rest of the uh, data center fabric. And now consider a cluster consisting of thousands of compute nodes, right? And, and you're experiencing a service degradation in the quality. And how do you isolate those problems, right? Uh, when we drill down at the node level, then again, there are various variables involved. There are various components involved in a virtualized shared environment. And there are various set of metrics uh, which we could be looking at uh, to get the visibility and to find out where the problem is, right? Uh, so let's take an example in this case for OpenStack again. Um, on the control plane side, again, we have OVN database, we have OVN controller. So there are various metrics associated with those, right? Whether it's related to the scale or the performance of the OVN database or, uh, side, right? And on the data plane side, again, uh, there are various metrics uh, which we can collect on the OVS, OVN, whether it's on the interface and port level metrics as well, right? Uh, if you are using, uh, let's say, OVS DPDK, then you have to look at uh, the pole mode, global pole mode driver uh, statistics. And there are system metrics and as well as the resource utilization metrics, right? So there are multiple dimensions of metrics which you want to look at, which could be the root cause, which could be the problem, or which 
could indicate or tell us where the problem is, right? And and similarly, you know, when we're talking about the different layers, uh, the problem could be at the NIC level, at the OBS OVN level, we may be oversubscribing uh, the buffers or the queue lens. And, uh, you know, while, you know, at the, in, at the initial deployment, uh, the CPU and the memory allocation may be great, right? Uh, based on the workloads and the traffic, uh, uh, which is uh, which the net uh, virtual infrastructure is exposed to, but with time, those things can change, right? And and whatever configurations and the performance as uh, resource allocation and the performance isolations we have put in place may not work to satisfy the SLAs for the end-to-end -end services. Right, and that's where the need for not just monitoring all these metrics across different dimensions, but how do we consume these metrics, right? How do we say that, okay, well, I'm getting all these metrics from different dimensions, I want to find out where the problem is. And that too, not reactively, but proactively. So, yes, one of the approaches there is that we can say, okay, uh, we can provide guidelines for the service providers and the network operators, uh, you know, to configure the network in such a way that uh, they have performance isolation as far as, you know, uh, techniques such as CPU partitioning or ISOL CPUs. But then, you know, not always the service providers want to go with those approaches because they see those peak utilizations uh, and anomalies only for a small percentage of the time. They don't want to have their uh, resources, uh, the CPUs uh, sitting idle and not doing anything for let's say 70% of the time or 80% of the time, right? So, so, so there is a trade-off which which is to be made between the resource optimization and the performance isolation, and that brings us to the fact that okay, we want to have more visibility on what is happening within my virtual infrastructure, right? How to out isolate the problem, but do it proactively as well. So, if if there are any non-voluntary CPU contact switches happening, right? Uh, if, if you're using TPDK, then on the OVS PFD, right? Or, or the on the QMU vCPU threads, you want to know about it before actually it impacts your end-to-end uh, -end service, right? And, and similarly, you know, how many resources you want to allocate for processing the IRQs. You want to make sure that the IRQ spill over from the shared CPU or the memory resources, which are CPUs, which are allocating for the IRQ processing. It's not impacting your workload performance, right? So, so that that is another aspect you need to look at. Now, what should be the vCPU to the queue mapping? what kind of hashing algorithms you want to use. And also, uh, you know, you want you want to make sure that all your transmit and receive queues and the buffers are actually utilized. You, you don't want to have a scenario where some of them are oversubscribed and some of them are not uh, utilized at all, right? Uh, so, so those optimizations uh, you want to strike, but, but for, all these things, right? Let's let's say you want to say, okay, I want to set my Q length or the buffer length to a certain value to get achieve higher throughput, but then you have a trade off to make to the getting the uh, you know the higher latency as well. So see so what you have those trade offs. Now, this is again in let's say uh, that you're saying kernel data path SRIV OVS TPDK, or if if you have acceleration technologies in place. If you have, let's say, some kind of hardware or flow technologies, you have BDPA, 
or if you have some new technology which is coming in later, right? So, so what I'm trying to allude to here is that there are variety of metrics and the variables, variety of variables which are involved there, right? And at a, even a single node level, and imagine that this is expanded to thousands of nodes. And how do you figure out where the problem is? Okay, so because of the complexity involved here, uh, what traditionally uh, most of the service providers and network operators have done is that, you know, their root cause analysis process is mostly manual, right? And, and they rely on the monitoring dashboards. But then again, imagine having these multi-dimensional metrics KPIs to look at through the dashboards and stuff. It, it makes the job very difficult, right? It in, it involves multiple entities, right? Whether you're looking at the, the infrastructure provider or uh, the network function provider or you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, some of the hardware vendor providers. And when, when you're looking at multiple entities involved there, you, you have to figure out where the problem is. What is the root cause there? And it takes multiple iterations to figure out what the problem is. Sometimes, based on uh, our conversations with uh, some of the service providers and network operators, uh, they say, you know, it takes weeks and months to resolve these problems because they have to spend some time on their side right, the operations teams. And then they, they have to, you know, once they figure out where the problem is, or at least they have some idea where the problem is, they have to follow up with the infrastructure vendor or the network function vendor or the hardware vendor, right? And then their engineering has to get involved in all those things. So, so essentially what I'm trying to say is that this is a very inefficient process, which is in place. It's a reactive approach impacting the SLAs and the service qualities uh, for the end customers, right? So so to, to, the, the way uh, the service for us and the network operators are going about is uh, let's over provision the capacity, right? And uh, that way we want to avoid this scenario as much as possible, okay? So with this, you know, this is the, essentially the framing of the problem which we are looking at, which most of the uh, service providers and network operators are facing. How do we detect these anomalies? How do we automate this process and not have this process you know, manual? So when we are talking about anomaly detection, right, whether it's a, a performance anomaly or a security anomalies, uh, there are three different methods you can look at, right? Uh, one of them is rule-based, uh, which is basically relies on, uh, you know, established patterns, signatures, and thresholds. The challenge there is that to establish those or create those patterns and signatures, it's difficult to scale. It's, it's very complex. It requires a subject matter experts or the domain experts in those areas, right? And as a result, it's difficult to scale. And also, it, you know, you cannot address uh, the novel anomalies because you are relying on the already the established patterns here. Uh, the other method uh, or the mechanisms which are involved there are statistical methods, uh, which rely on uh, defining, uh, you know, uh, a normal behavior of your network or the services or the uh, workloads which you are deploying in your virtual infrastructure. And uh, any deviation from this normal behavior is considered to be an anomaly. The, again, the challenge is here is when we are talking about, uh, you know, the network and the telco uh, side of things, then because of the diversity of the workloads and the usage patterns and stuff and the variability in the network itself, um, it, it's hard to define what is normal and what is not normal, right? And uh, also these methods are associated with the long convergence times. 
So there are challenges with the existing methods, and that's one of the reasons why the process uh, is manual and reactive, right? But you know, with this whole momentum across the industry for machine learning and AI, and also the enabling technologies on the hardware as well as on the software side, I think this presents a opportunity to the industry that we can automate, right? We can automate this process for the root cause analysis, for the correlation across the various dimensions of metrics, right? When we are talking about the metrics on the uh, uh, application or the service level, we're talking about the metrics at the resource allocation level, we're talking about the metrics at the infrastructure level, right? Or for that matter, even at the policy level, when we're talking about performance or SQS or security policy, how do we do that correlation, right? How do we find out where the problem is? Machine learning presents us an opportunity to deal with those large data sets across multiple dimensions to come up with a solution which is proactive and not necessarily reactive. And, and to address the scalability challenge as well, right? Okay, so what are the concerns here uh, with machine learning? It sounds great, right? Uh, it sounds like a, a magic box, which will provide you all the answer, but obviously uh, that's not the case. So, so the challenge there is that, you know, machine learning or predictive uh, analytics have been there in the industry for some time, but, but there is insufficient market adoption there, right? Primarily because we treat it as a black box. What is happening in that black box? We don't have much visibility. We don't have the level of confidence uh, where we can say, yes, uh, the outcome of this machine. learning models or this solution based on machine learning is going to uh, give me, uh, you know, the high accuracy and I can take the remediation uh, measures based on that. And that's where you know, the interpretability or uh, what is called, uh, you know, the explainable AI side of things, which comes into picture. Okay, uh, so let's take one example here, right? Um, I want to take this example of a self-organizing map-based uh, approach or SAM-based approach for machine learning. Uh, this was a study or research done by uh, 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 Vodafone. Uh, and again, the reference is at the bottom of this slide here. Uh, what they did was basically they did a joint analysis of the infrastructure uh, utilization. Uh, infrastructure resource utilization and the application, uh, or you can say the VNF uh, metrics there, right? Application performance metrics. So, so it it was a joint analysis, or you could say the correlation between the two different dimensions there, and uh, they took the real data uh, data from the data centers. That was the key there, key thing there. They they used a uh, 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 open source tool, which is Somo Clue, uh, which is basically open source uh, SOM implementation, they were able to achieve 99% uh, accuracy, right? So SOM is essentially, uh, uh, I would say, uh, unsupervised uh, clustering approach, uh, which tries to map your machine learning model to the input data sets which you are getting, right? Uh, it, it's a, again, a neural uh, network. Uh, so, so the challenges here, uh, which they uh, pointed out in this particular study or the research was that, okay, um, they had scale challenges, right? Uh, so you need to have a large data sets. How do you get those data sets, right? And also lot high processing time to process those data sets and get to the convergence of the machine learning models uh, to detect those anomalies, right? So those were some of the challenges, but nonetheless, 
This is just one example. There are a lot of research, a lot of studies which has gone in into how to use machine learning for detecting performance as well as security anomalies for NFE networks, right? For the VNFs. Uh, this could be applied to enterprise workloads as well, and it's not just limited to the VNFs. Okay. So, some of the key challenges there, right, uh, are that how do you generate, right? How, how do you get your machine learning models to train in non production environments? Because it needs a lot of data large data sets, the conversion time, if you put it directly in the production networks, will be large. And then, how do you get the level of confidence, right? That the output which you are getting is actually accurate and you can take actions based on that, right? It's still considered uh, by many uh, to be a black box. So yes, we, we need to have the metrics collection using standardized frameworks like open telemetry framework where the industry is coalescing to. But then how can you train these models to a sufficient level in a non-production environment, right? So, so we need mechanisms to simulate these workloads to mimic the world, real world scenarios uh, fortunately, when we are talking about the virtual or the shared infrastructure, uh, it's relatively easier to do that, right? Uh, we, we can have tools to generate those real world scenarios, whether it's related to the resource allocations, right? Or uh, it's related to injecting certain faults, whether the, the, the CPU faults in the network or the memory faults and things like that, or you know the oversubscription of the DXRX use and all those things. So, so we can apply these domain knowledge which we already have based on the guidelines which we are providing to the service providers and the network operators and take that knowledge to develop a sandbox or a simulated environment we can where we can train these machine learning models. Of course, uh, training these machine learning models in our production environment does not guarantee that you will get the accuracy right away when you put it into production. Uh, there is some fine tuning on the hyperparameter side, et cetera, which still has to be done, right? So, but there, the building blocks are there in this particular case where you have the metrics collections, you have your standardized framework for collecting the telemetry, and because of the various enabling technologies in the industry, uh, we have an opportunity to provide a closed loop automation, essentially automating not just the root cause analysis, but also doing the anomaly mitigation, right? So if you have sufficient information or coming from these machine learning models, if we have the high level of confidence there, where we can say, okay, I know why this problem is happening. And this is the configuration change I need to take, make in my infrastructure, right? Uh, to remediate this problem. So, so essentially, it's a fault localization and the quality of information which we are getting for the anomaly as well. So, so those things come into picture. And again, those are the key building blocks here and the gating factors uh, for the adoption for, uh, of these techniques here. Okay, um, so, so the objective of my talk here is essentially uh, to put focus on the fact that the traditional way of root cause analysis or the remediation is not the way to go forward, right? Uh, with the enabling technologies coming into picture, whether it's related to the, you know, the AI or machine learning hardware 
or the machine learning models, right? It is, I think it, it behooves us to revisit uh, the predictive analytics using machine learning in our virtualized environment so that we can achieve that closed loop automation which we have talked about for a long time, right? I, I, I think we are at the point where uh, a certain amount of resources and efforts and all those things, especially in the open source communities, uh, can make a difference. So uh, just want to point out some things here, uh, you know, uh, some of the directions uh, which uh, we can take. Uh, so. I, I did mention about the standardized uh, observability frameworks such as open telemetry. That work is going on. Red Hat is already working on some of those aspects here. Uh, similarly, you know, open source tools for sandbox capabilities, generating a sandbox, pre-training, ability to pre-train your models in a lab environment, and uh, you know, fault or anomaly uh, fault injection tools basically, uh, so that you can train your models for uh, anomaly detections uh, in non-protection environments. And, and similarly, right, uh, on, I, I would say that when, when, as part of that creating that sandbox, uh, how do you have those, you know, how do you mimic the behavior of, of the VNFs? So traditionally we have used test PMD, but then again, that is not sufficient to mimic the behavior of the real world VNFs. It's more is required there. Uh, so, so there are some open source efforts which are going on right now. I can uh, point to uh, one of the things which is, uh, you know, uh, DPTK based uh, graph router or the grout. Uh, so, so there's a link for that. And then again, um, you can look into that aspect, which essentially is enabling not just uh, you know uh, enabling creating creation of the sandbox, but uh, also uh, enabling the collection or the op, you know trying out the optimization techniques uh, for the uh, DPTK based acceleration technologies. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's the open source uh, SOM implementations, which was used in one of the studies, Open Telemetry. And then again, the, there are a variety of research uh, and studies which has been done uh, on how to use machine learning based uh, anomaly detection in NFV. Um, all right, uh, that's all I have to say uh, uh, for this session. Um, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to having more conversations uh, with uh, folks uh, from the industry. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Gurpreet. Um, are there any questions in the room? I think Gurpreet is online, so we should be able to ask questions. All right. Uh, do we have any online questions? All right. So one question online is, did you identify a set of relevant or missing metrics? Yeah, so, so you know, uh, typically, let's say if we if we take uh, OpenStack or even for that matter, OpenShift or Kubernetes and deployments uh, from Red Hat perspective, yes, we, we have looked at some of the metrics which you are exposing traditionally through service telemetry framework, such as uh, you know collect the and telemeter and stuff. But the the key thing here is right, right, that. Some of the metrics which I pointed out, let's say uh, the, the IRQ related metrics, or having you know uh, essentially uh, having visibility into when the contact switches are happening for the CPU or involuntary contact switches, right? Th those are some of the key things which we have not been reporting. But that's not really the focus here, right? We can provide these metrics. We can provide a lot of data to the service providers. The challenge here is that we don't want to provide data. We don't want to, we want to provide answers to them. And when we provide all these data to the service providers and network operators, 
they just don't know how to process it. They just don't know what to do with it, right? So, so definitely the key, one of the key aspects is to provide the right metrics and you know uh, to to provide that visibility and all that stuff. But the, the the key part here is essentially can we provide them that intelligence, right? So they don't have to spend weeks and months to sift through that data to figure out those problems and have a reactive approach where we are having weeks and months of. Uh, you know, uh, troubleshooting process, various entities involved and all that stuff. Uh, we, we uh, to, to answer the question uh, specifically, yes, uh, there are some metrics which we are cataloging and uh, we, we will expose that in the solutions in the upstream as well as in the downstream for the Red, Red Hat products. Um, and this is a work in progress. And once we get through that phase one, then that's one. That's when we uh, start talking about, you know, uh, the AI ML applicability. And I, I will say that, you know, since we are talking about here as an open source community, and uh, it's it's a definitely a point where we need to spend more time on maybe launching some pro uh, projects. I would say on the, in the open source community and the crowdsource uh, arena, uh, you know, to address this space and. I, I always believe that when when you have you know these enabling technologies uh, which are coming together at this point of time, we can create a, some disruptive innovation here, right? So that that would be my answer here. All right, I think thanks, Gurpreet, for uh, answering that. We did lose some of your text; uh, we got some distortion, but I think we got the gist of it. Um, all right, th thanks a lot, Gurpreet, for your uh, presentation and answering the question. Uh, one more explosive. Thank you. All right. Thank you.